We said previously that CERN was established through diplomatic agreements in Europe. In fact, it was restricted to Western Europe. The entire Eastern Bloc was excluded. Western governments feared that the Soviet Union would manipulate science collaboration for political gains. After the Berlin Wall was put up in 1961, East Germany in particular found it immensely difficult to send any researchers to CERN. West Germany insisted that participation in CERN would give the East German government a pretext to legitimize its own existence. Scientific collaboration, in other words, was suspected of being a manipulative political tool. However, individual scientists in the West thought that the idea of the wall could be countered by demonstrating the advantages of a liberal, open science community. Scientists, including CERN's director generals, advocated on behalf of their East German colleagues. Eventually, the scientists reached a compromise with the governments. Visiting scholars, including those from the East, would be dealt with solely at the administrative level with no mention of politics. Thus, East German high-energy physicists could participate in various CERN experiments. During a time when travel to the West was virtually impossible, scientists were now able to reach across the Iron Curtain in order to participate in research. CERN is a great example of where diplomacy may not be the explicit goal or function of scientific partnerships, but science can lay the groundwork for building a relationship after diplomatic relations improve. As Dr. Greg Stone said, science is often the first thing countries agree to collaborate on after coming out of conflict. When Jordan and Israel signed their peace treaty in 1994, one of the first things they collaborated on was a water sharing agreement. We've already seen how the famous handshake in space between a US astronaut and a Soviet cosmonaut symbolized the thawing of tensions during the Cold War. And although that moment didn't lead to the end of the Cold War itself, it did mark the beginning of cooperation, uh, one that continues today in orbit aboard the International Space Station. The station has been continuously occupied for more than 12 years by astronauts of 15 different nationalities. And it's more than just a collaboration. Since NASA retired its space shuttles in 2011, the American space program has relied on Russian rockets to transport supplies and crew members to and from the space station. And in the future, we may see private companies such as SpaceX transport US astronauts to the station another example of the blurring between state and non-state actors. We've also already touched on how scientific agreements are among the first diplomatic instruments put in place after countries come back from conflict or political strain. Let's look at the relationship between the United States and Cuba. Believe it or not, there's a long history of collaboration between these two nations. It was Cuban scientist Carlos Finlay and U.S. researcher Jesse Lasser, who unraveled the role of the mosquito that transmits yellow fever back in the 19th century. But starting in 1962, the two countries had no formal diplomatic relations. The United States imposed sanctions and an economic embargo against Cuba, and this lasted for over 50 years. However, as written in the New York Times, a hurricane that hits Cuba doesn't ask for a visa before entering the United States. Understanding the progression of weather events, especially tropical storms, was crucial for both countries. Even while the governments had no communication, the meteorological agencies continued to exchange satellite data. They jointly analyzed radar and collaborated on storm forecasting. Here, scientific cooperation wasn't optional, but a matter of life or death in the face of a severe threat that affected both countries. For this reason, scientists were one of the few groups of US citizens who were able to gain visas to travel to Cuba during this long period of no diplomatic relations. Why is that? The scientific issues binding the US and Cuba weren't just meteorological. They included health and biodiversity as well. With only 90 miles separating Cuba from Florida, the two countries share a marine ecosystem and must cooperate 
on environmental protection. Cubans are also well positioned to detect emerging infectious diseases of concern to the United States, such as dengue, chikungunya, and of course, the Zika virus. These are all serious mosquito-borne diseases that we don't have vaccines for. These viruses can spread rapidly in the region, raising fears among public health experts. Cuba also has a robust biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry that was not accessible to Americans. After Presidents Barack Obama and Raul Castro normalized diplomatic relations in 2015, the relationship between the countries wasn't simply bridging a vacuum. There had already been a robust scientific and often non-governmental collaboration in place for over a hundred years. And when diplomatic relations were restored, scientific agreements on marine protected areas, on public health, were the first to be signed. This shows us the importance of sustained scientific engagement even during times of political strain. The scientific relationships put in place before restoration of diplomatic ties allow the two countries to work together more easily. It also allowed them to take advantage of the immediate opportunities for collaboration in urgent health and environmental issues affecting both countries. The role of non-governmental U.S. science organizations like the AAAS and funders like the Lounsbury Foundation were crucial. For example, U.S. sanctions forbade U.S. government research funding to be used in Cuba. A scientific NGO with private funding can go somewhere a government cannot. Similarly, scientific engagements between American and Iranian scientists, such as those being led by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences on the U.S. side, have provided one of the few enduring links between the two countries over a decade that has been marked by great mistrust and tension. So why should countries engage in science for diplomacy? As we've seen, science for diplomacy draws on the universal language of science to engage countries, reinforce relationships, and ease tensions in situations of political strain. Scientists can come together even when their governments are in conflict. This is one way that science contributes to a country's soft power. Joseph Nye, a former State Department official and former dean of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, pioneered the theory of soft power. Hard power uses coercive approaches such as military action or economic pressure. For instance, economic embargoes and sanctions. Soft power, in contrast, is the cultivation of relationships, mutual respect, and admiration. Soft power refers to non-state, culturally attractive factors that may predispose people to sympathize with a foreign culture based on affinity for its products and values. You could think of Disney as a major source of soft power for the United States. While a nation's entertainment industry, its food, art, sports, may all be sources of soft power, arguably, scientific excellence may be the most powerful. Students from around the world have historically studied in the United States and the EU, for example, because of their reputation as scientific superpowers. And soft power can also have longer term, more diffuse effects. In the 1970s, an Iranian student arrived at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to study for a PhD in physics. His name was Ali Akbar Salehi, and he would go on to be Iran's instrumental negotiators during the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. This brings us to the third dimension of science diplomacy, science in diplomacy. 